Thanks for downloading Friday Night Comedy from BBC Radio 4. If you want to find out more, visit the Radio 4 website. But not before you listen to this week's Now Show. It's called Topical for a Reason, you know. Hello, I'm Steve Punt. And I'm Hugh Dennis. With us are Kiri pritchard McLean, Lisa Jen Brown and Tidder Owen. And this is... much indeed. Hello and welcome to The Now Show, coming to you this week from Landidno. Now, there is a famous precedent for this. During the Second World War, the BBC evacuated the whole radio comedy department to North Wales to escape bombing raids from mainland Europe. Yes, so the fact we've been sent here in the week of Article 50... <laughs> does make you wonder quite what response from Brussels the BBC were expecting. <laughs> but it is very nice to be here. Clandidno has a beach, a cable car, and the most entertaining pier since Lord Heseltine last spotted a squirrel. <laughs> Wales narrowly voted leave, but actually this recording was planned long before we knew this would be Article 50 week. Other BBC shows, however, have been struggling with how to convey the historical significance of the occasion. Yes, they have. Uh, BBC Breakfast, for example, thought long and hard about this and decided to mark the historic triggering of Article 50 by following the A50 trunk road from Warrington to Leicester. Good morning. We're on the road this week, the A50, talking about Article 50 and what businesses like these in Stoke want out of a Brexit deal. Great feature. Uh, and, <laughs> and the idea, I believe, of one of their producers, a Mr A Partridge. <laughs> In a way, of course, they were lucky it was Article 50. If it had been Article 470, the reporter would have been doing a piece to camera while taking a hairpin bend through the Brecon beacons. <laughs> Ironically, given the millions of words expended on it in the media all week, Article 50 itself is very short, although nobody agrees how short it is. The Financial Times said... 262 words. The Guardian said... 250. Politico said... 259. CNN claimed... 255. Closest guess... Wins a cuddly toy. <laughs> Quite how are we going to get agreement with 27 countries and 751 MEPs when we can't even agree how many words there are on one page of a document? I don't know. Uh, the famous Article 50 we've been hearing about for months was written by Lord Kerr of Kinlochard. Who I thought was killed in Game of Thrones Series 2. <laughs> who has said that he never expected anyone to actually use it. It was only put there in case there was a coup in an EU country. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. You know, the incredibly unlikely event of an unelected government taking power and crushing all opposition. Not only is Article 50 itself very vague, but even the government's own guidelines on how it works, issued back in January, aren't much help. The section on notifying our intention to leave states... There is no time frame for when we have to do so, or in what form. In other words, we could have done it any way we wanted. Never mind sending a boring hand-delivered letter. We could have scrawled, we're leaving in magic marker across the naked torso of Boris Johnson and sent him over the channel on a zip wire. <laughs> we could have sent it by Snapchat just to annoy Amber Rudd. Yeah. <laughs> Given that over the next two years we can only hope that the UK government knows what it's doing, it is slightly worrying that the Home Secretary told an interviewer this week that terrorists should be stopped from using social media by getting... The best people who understand the technology, who understand the necessary hashtags to stop this stuff from being put up. <laughs> The necessary hashtags. <laughs> that sound you hear is the nation's under 40s laughing hysterically, while the nation's over 60s wonder what on earth they're laughing at. <laughs> But that sort of them-and-us attitude has been the problem up to now with Brexit. Up to now, it's still been two sides, the Brexiteers and the Ramonas. Rock, 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 the the Ramonas. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, but now, of course, the... It took but nearly a week to write that. <laughs> it's all very dramatic. It's like an unfolding soap opera. It's like EastEnders. I've got news for you. I'm going to have a Brexit. Do what? 
It's great, isn't it? We've been trying for years and it's finally happened. You can't have a Brexit, it'll ruin your life. Who done this to you? What's this that I hear about a Brexit? Oh, hello, Nicola. <laughs> but I like Brussels, he's a great stepdad. He's no good for you, as we're family, and family comes first. I've been with him for 43 years. Nicola, Nicola, always remember, blood is thicker than Juncker. <laughs> And then, <laughs> we're packing them in tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we really are. And then on Wednesday, the drama ramped up further as Sir Tim Barrow headed to Brussels, bearing a letter that everyone knew was coming to a man who'd been waiting for it for nine months. Sir Tim, though, of course, was once the British ambassador to Russia, so delivering messages whose recipient already knows what's in them. <laughs> Fairly ex familiar kind of experience for him. Delivering something so high profile with total secrecy, though, is a tricky task. So it was either Sir Tim or whichever Team Sky doctor delivered that package to Bradley Wiggins. <laughs> and that was that. Article 50 was triggered. Yes, triggered. Now, the word trigger, of course, was important because it made it sound exciting, where, in fact, it was just delivering a letter. See, when you trigger something, it sounds like you're in a bunker and you've got twin keys and lights flashing. Triggering Article 50 sounds like it's this. <laughs> Where, in fact, it was this. Postman Pat. <laughs> That's really all it was. There was, um, there was actually a misprint in one newspaper which claimed we were about to tigger Article 50. <laughs> Although, possibly, that's not actually far from the truth, uh, given that two years from now, his song could be our national anthem. You know, the bit where he says... I'm the only one! <laughs> anyway, now it's happened, and we've all got to get behind it. Here at the BBC, it's been made quite clear that a positive attitude is to be expected, and you will be noticing this across all BBC programming. <laughs> So, let's have a look at this next object. My goodness, where did you get this? Hi, yeah, well, um, it's been in the family for generations. Has it? Well, it really is very lovely, isn't it? Yeah, it's 18th century, we think, handmade porcelain. Oh, what a beautiful thing. And the rumour which comes from my grandmother is that it's French. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, I dropped it. <laughs> Now, of course, this positive attitude is important because there is a lot to do in the next two years. There are 20,893 laws to be scrutinised, which is 40 legal measures a day to be agreed. So hopefully at least two of them will have been done by the end of this programme. <laughs> Still, it's happened, it's happening, and now it is happening. The last word really should go to the Ramonas. Hey, oh, let's go! Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So now, please welcome back to the Now Show, comedian originally from Anglesey, but now based in Salford, uh, although given Lendino relies on Arriva trains, it would have been easier to get her to come down to London. Please welcome Kerry pritchard McLean. Hi. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Lexit means Lexit. Do we all see this? Theresa May met with Nicola Sturgeon to discuss the future of Britain and the Daily Mail front page said, never mind Brexit, who won legs it? Yeah. <laughs> they decided to focus on who had better legs, or as they called them, pins. <laughs> also, no one in tabloid papers is allowed to have pins without flaunting them. Uh, flaunt means using them to walk from one location to another. <laughs> It was front page two as well, boldly leading with a nonsensical, deliberately provocative and sexist headline. I think this is the most Daily Mail front page since they ran with Hurrah the Black Shirts. <laughs> Google it, they did. <laughs> and that one did have a picture of Oswald Mosley's sensational pins. <laughs> And you know what? Maybe there's nothing to be bothered about. It could be that to be irritated by such an obvious piece of sexism is oversensitive. After all, Theresa May herself said, just a bit of fun. Just a bit of fun. I don't think she knows what fun is. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. Because <laughs> also, according to an interview with Theresa May in Vogue, yeah, that's happening now. Our Prime Minister is talking to Vogue about a capsule wardrobe. 
me said that she decided she wanted to be an MP when she was 12 years old and then volunteered to stuff envelopes for the Tories, which seems incredibly young to be aligning yourself politically. That's not a normal job for a teenager, is it? Normal jobs, uh, paper round, work in the tuck shop, working in a factory, building smartphones, that kind of thing. <laughs> I didn't know anything when I was 12. I wasn't worried about free markets and limited government. I was too busy trying to get adult men to buy me cigarettes from the Londis in Bangor. <laughs> seems incredibly precocious to me. How can you know anything about anything at that age, let alone about politics? Who hits the age of 12 and thinks that they want to be a politician? Timmy, what do you want to be when you grow up? A YouTuber? That does sound exciting. And one of the few jobs that won't be replaced by robots soon, so very well done. <laughs> and what about you, Teresa? You want to take benefits away from people with dementia and deport foreign nurses? <laughs> Well, as long as you're in some sassy leopard print kitten heels, <laughs> that should pull focus enough for you to get away with it. It's so hard to figure out, if anything, what May stands for. And the interviewer literally asks her, and you still come away from the answer none the wiser. May said that she believed in opportunity, freedom, security, which is less a belief system and more the words you'd find spray painted on the walls of a dystopian labour camp. <laughs> Part of me thinks she's got them all embroidered on a pillow, like how normal people have life, love, laugh. <laughs> it turns out that Vogue, having all the ethical philosophy of Robert Mugabe after six GNTs, <laughs> can't really turn its hand to a Frost Nixon style showdown. <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm impressed by anyone who can pull off leather trousers. Genuinely. Genuinely. <laughs> I wore a pair once, and I was going for a sort of a short, like, sexy, chubby, Welsh Chrissy Hind vibe. <laughs> no. What I got was looking like a DFS sofa with a yeast infection. <laughs> I don't want to be another lefty being outraged at what is almost definitely Sarah Vine trolling. Yep. A woman wrote that article. Sarah Vine is part of the uh, power couple of knobheadery uh, with Michael Gove. <laughs> Do you think it's ironic that a woman who's married to a man who looks like a pair of glasses dropped in a hotel breakfast? <laughs> Put so much emphasis on appearance. <laughs> spammy, and he's spammy. <laughs> You know what I do want is it's to stop buying into the distractions around politicians and start holding them to account. And I want the press to analyse male and female politicians equally. I'm not saying we should judge male politicians on their looks or masculinity. I don't think it would hurt, though, would it? It'd be all right. I mean, there's a reason Justin Trudeau gets good press. It's not his policies, is it? It's his arms. Oh, my God. <laughs> Everyone's so busy looking at his guns, they're too aroused to care about the actual guns he's selling to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> it's all about the arms with that guy. Oh. That's how you do a pun, lads! <laughs> Although it does make the news infinitely more watchable when Trudeau is on it, looking like a Disney prince who ended up working in finance. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm saying is, would it kill Tom Watson to do a bit of Pilates? <laughs> this is an article about Brexit, one of the most important political moments in the world at present. I want our press to be scrutinising small print in policy. We need our newspapers to not play into the narrative that women's worth is in their appearance. So maybe let's stop caring about who wore it best, whether someone should be wearing a tie, how sassy someone's footwear is, and focus on the biggest issues of our time. How is Trudeau so charming and do you think that he would go out with me? <laughs> Thank you very much. So, tech is in the news again. From Amber Rudd's claim that WhatsApp encryption provides a safe haven for terrorists, to children being enticed to watch unsuitable spoof episodes of Peppa Pig on YouTube. Yes, uh, the internet, of course, has become a massive playground for kids and teenagers, but has its importance taken us by surprise? To help us answer these questions, would you please welcome journalist, writer and broadcaster, Peter Curran. Hello, Peter. Hello, Peter. 
So, Peter, your Channel 4 show, Wired World, was broadcast in the 90s, wasn't it? So did your show accurately predict the way the world would be shaped by the It internet? was as terrible as most other things in the 90s, <laughs> from, from this pers perspective. It was rubbish. Um, I've got a review here from Campaign magazine. Wired World failed to entertain or inform. I really wanted to like it, but as the credits rolled, I found myself heading for the dishwasher with rare enthusiasm. <laughs> Anything Rachel. else you'd like to know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what did, you, what did you get right and what did you get wrong? What we got right was we had a guy on uh, talking about domain names. They were going to be really big, the dot-coms. Then was the time to buy them. They're only £50. This researcher came up to me afterwards and said, are you going to go in on this? Like, it's only 50 quid. And I said, no, don't be stupid. I mean, it's, it's, it's 50 quid. It's a lot of money, a bit of a waste and stuff. So he duly went off. Uh, borrowed some money and bought ski.com and tennis.com and all these things. And uh, within two years, I'd bought a flat in Acton and he'd uh, bought a monastery in Spain. <laughs> With all the monks in it? Mm. <laughs> if he wanted. Mm. <laughs> so, but you must have had people on. Did you have people on who did sort of predict it correctly? Uh, yeah, just before I started doing this TV show, one of the first radio things I did was a late night show on GLR, which was the BBC's London station. It was late night Sunday. No guests of, of any kind of mainstream popularity would come out at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night. And we'd get lots of conspiracy theorists, ex-KGB agents trying to flog their memoirs and stuff. And one night I had this guy about 1991. He was kind of looked a bit like a hippie. He had this sort of crazy vision that, um, you know, all the world's computers could talk to each other. And uh, I just kind of thought, you know, gifted savant idiot, just wait until the cruel commercial world stamps on your idealism. And it was uh, Tim Berners-Lee. <laughs> <laughs> He's done all right, isn't he? <laughs> do, you, um, do you worry about the sort of lack of control today? You've got kids, haven't you? Yeah. Did you ever make any attempt at, at digital detoxing with them? Or did you ever sort of try and have a weekend away with like, no broadband or any of that? Yeah, we do do that. Um, actually still doing it. Uh, go up to Scotland to this remote little cottage in the northwest highlands. There's no TV, no internet. Kids don't go on holiday with us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it works. Yeah, it really, you know. Do you think, though, that, that as we're doing now, we, we do tend to focus on the negatives uh, uh, about the internet? I mean, it, uh, it is a brilliant thing, isn't it? It's yeah, an amazing thing. But, but it's thing. us. It's, it's the real horrible, revolting, perverted, egotistical, self-regarding, vicious, narrow-minded humanity kind of writ large. It's only, <laughs> it is only a reflection of us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was trying to think of any way in which I could disagree with you about that. Do you know, I mean, it's most of the data that they mine. I bought a hose pipe, right? And all they then do is send me more information about hose pipes. <laughs> don't they? All the marketing yeah. companies. And you think that is so stupid because I have just bought a hose pipe. Yeah. I don't want any more hose pipes. Yeah. But do you, though, Hugh? <laughs> Well, Wouldn't the second one be nice? Be just in case? <laughs> I don't I mind. Some, I uh... don't mind looking at them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the internet has also given us an extraordinary <laughs> amount of acronyms and slang, and we wondered if we could uh, test you on your knowledge of these. You have teenage children. But listen, uh, I, have to, I have to say at this point, without kind of undercutting any uh, journalistic rigor here, I'm a total chancer that bumbled into uh, this, this world I have. I say, I'm confessing again, forgive me. Yes, uh, go ahead, Steve. OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what do, they, what do these things stand for? Right. CBA. Uh, Christian Brothers Association. <laughs> <laughs> Good guess. If only. What does it mean, Steve? It means can't be asked. Uh, well done. On, uh, on, on social media slang. Yeah. DBA. Uh, don't bother asking. Quite well, correct. We, just, we have asked. Very so good. we can answer. <laughs> Very good. BA. Uh, bugger all. British Airways. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm amazed you didn't know that. Yeah, Peter. that's quite a, quite a well known Very brand. surprised you didn't know that. You've been. <laughs> Mining into the data to get... I hear they've cut the free meals. If you were to walk okay. in on your uh, teenager and you saw they typed P-I-R, what would that mean? P-I-R. Person in... Um, restorative justice <laughs> programme? <laughs> uh, P-I-R is parents in room. Ah, ah you see. see yeah. Yes. <laughs> Call yourself parents? Yeah. Why did that come as a surprise? <laughs> 
And finally, this is from the Urban Dictionary. What does this mean? LMA, ORO, TFB, TCS, TCN, DFB, OOT, WIF, OAG, WLL, BGW, THR, OOT, SAI, AKB, ARB. Time to log off, darling. <laughs> <laughs> what it actually means is laughing my arse off, rolling on the floor, biting the carpet, scaring the cat, nearly dying by falling out of the window in front of a guy who looks like Bill Gates, who then, horrified, runs out on the street and is accidentally killed by a yellow bulldozer. <laughs> Although, I would have accepted the answer, WTF. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Peter Curran. <laughs> and now, would you please welcome Tidda Rowan. Hello, Sandidno. Oh. Or as it's known in Welsh, Sandidno. <laughs> <laughs> This, uh, by the way, is a North Wales accent, which you don't often hear outside Wales, because, you know, the stereotypical Welsh accents will be the South Wales one that you often hear on programmes like Gavin and Stacey and Crime Watch and Cop Shoot <laughs> Cameras. <laughs> it's not always easy having a North Wales accent. Google announced this week that they're launching a new device to rival Amazon's Alexa. Now, controlled by voice recognition, the smart device is able to answer any questions by searching the internet and also control smart home devices such as lights. All this is wonderful news, unless, of course, you sound like my North Walian wife. I bought her one of these devices for Christmas. Now, one of the great pleasures of life is listening to my wife trying to converse with Alexa. <laughs> Alexa! What time does Max and Spencer's open on a Sunday? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. What time does Max and Spencer's open on a Sunday? OK, you want me to search for a Karl Marx ice cream sundae? No! And that's when the fun starts, because, because that's when my wife will put on what she thinks is an English accent. <laughs> what time? <laughs> the Smarks and Spencers. <laughs> Open on the Sunday. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. She ends up just screaming at Alexa in Welsh with all the lights turned off. <laughs> Now, we pride ourselves on um, being different in Wales. We have our own government uh, in the wonderful Senedd building in Cardiff Bay, which has wide-ranging powers, like the ability to raise or lower the air conditioning. <laughs> they, um... <laughs> they were given a goldfish once, but they didn't look after it. <laughs> that died. No, no, it wasn't a goldfish. What was it again? No, it was the NHS. That was it. Uh... <laughs> President Donald J. Trump has a slogan, let's make America great again. The Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, says, let's make a better Scotland. You see, the Welsh First Minister, Carwyn Jones, on the other hand, not quite as ambitious with his slogan. <laughs> let's make Wales know who I am. We have... <laughs> we have no idea. So the Scottish Government decided to press ahead with another independence referendum and in the week when Nicola Sturgeon insisted she wants Scotland to rejoin the EU, luckily for her, they found billions more barrels of oil off the coast of Shetland. All she needs now to round off a pretty good week is for the Loch Ness Monster to start posing for photos <laughs> and Donald Trump to find out his mother was actually Welsh. <laughs> Theresa May, on the other hand, is looking more and more like an overworked school teacher who has completely lost control of her classroom. What is it now, Scotland? Now is not the time. Can't you see I'm busy? No, you can't leave. Sit down. And, and please stop swearing. Wales, where on earth do you think you're going? Of course you can't go with Scotland. Don't be ridiculous. Look, you're upsetting Northern Ireland and we all know what happens when they get angry. <laughs> if the Union did break up and all these countries went their separate ways, I'd be worried about the customs border between Wales and England because if it's anything like the airport we have on Anglesey, it's going to be an absolute shambles. <laughs> 
well, we call it an airport. There's only so much you can do with one aeroplane. <laughs> a shed and a tea machine. <laughs> one aeroplane. And it goes down to Cardiff in the morning and it comes back in the afternoon. But honestly, they have the cheek and the panache in this airport in Anglesey to have an arrivals board under the patches <laughs> of the patches board. They bought a second-hand one from Manchester Airport. <laughs> it used to be there. All the destinations of the world used to be on it. It's in Anglesey now. <laughs> when you check in at the desk, they don't ask you the usual security questions like, have you packed the bag yourself? Are you, are you carrying anything you shouldn't be? It's not like that at all. Hello. Checking in, are we? Uh, yes, please. I've just got a few questions to ask you, if that's OK. Yes, that's fine. How's your dad these days? Is he keeping well? <laughs> uh, yes, he's fine, thank you, yes. Oh, are you going anywhere nice? <laughs> um, well, Cardiff, funnily enough. Oh, lovely. Listen, don't, don't you want to check my bags? Oh, no, don't be silly. I was in school with you. <laughs> So I'm worried. I'm worried. If the union breaks up, England might even want to build a wall and, and, and get us to pay for it. You know, we could probably manage some shrubs, but a wall? <laughs> we, already have, we already have extreme vetting, though, but it means something completely different in Wales. <laughs> it usually involves a stranded goat, a cliff and a rectal thermometer. <laughs> But the technology industry is clearly gearing up for the breakup of the union. There are going to be new emojis for smartphones. Soon we'll be able to include the English, Scottish and Welsh national flags on our text messages. That's going to make everything better, isn't it? <laughs> Opinion polls vary wildly. Um, but one published on St David's Day this year said only 6% of Welsh people believed Wales should be independent. And that was on St David's Day. You know, you'd think some people would have said yes, just to be polite. <laughs> so <laughs> I suppose I'm happy for now that we have our little WhatsApp flag. And I imagine that uh, Nicola Sturgeon will find a new s for her new little emoji too in a few months as she types, bye bye, Teresa, wavy hand, Scottish flag, champagne bottle, middle finger. <laughs> Then Therese will get them from Wales. You OK, hun? <laughs> Sad face, broken heart, Welsh flag. <laughs> it's Carwin, by the way. <laughs> Carwin Jones. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Bye! And that's it from Landed Now. Thank you very much for listening and goodbye. Goodbye! You've been listening to The Now Show, starring Steve Punk, Hugh Dennis, Kiri Pritchard McLean, Lisa Jen Brown, Tina Rowan and Peter Curran. It was written by the cast with additional material from Gareth Gwynn, Sarah Morgan, Robin Morgan and Clint Edwards. The producer was Joe Nunnery. It was a BBC Studios production. That was The Now Show from Friday Night Comedy on BBC Radio 4. If you've enjoyed this download, why not visit the Radio 4 website where you'll find other programmes to download and keep forever, entirely free.